welcome this week uh, to another of our Route Consultant weekly webinars. Um, for those of you who are here for the first time, my name is Josh Gregory. I am one of the directors on our consulting team here. Um, so for all of our regular attendees, welcome back. And if you've never been to one of these, uh, we do try to have a lot of fun here. Um, we will do and go through some content first. And then after that, Bridget and I will open up a, a live Q&A where we will answer as many of your questions as we can possibly get through in the time. Um, and as I mentioned, Bridget will be uh, my co-host today. She'll be joining a little bit later. She is one of our consultants here on the team. So um, once we get to the Q&A, I will bring her on and we'll talk through any of your questions you have. Um, before I get started, though, I do have to read the uh, boring disclaimer, but I have to read it every week. Um, Route Consultant is not endorsed by and is not recommended by Federal Express Corporation and FedEx Ground. Route Consultant is not sponsored by, is not approved by, is not associated with, and has no connection whatsoever with Federal Express Corporation or FedEx Ground. Uh, so all that means is that you're not going to hear any sensitive, uh, non-public information here. Um, but we do want to make sure that you get some valuable content and get your questions answered, and we will try to have some fun. Um, uh, before we get to that, though, there are a couple of upcoming events that I just wanted to highlight quickly. So um, for new investors, we have a virtual summit coming up on July 7th and an in-person summit in our offices here in Nashville on July 28th. So if you have never attended one of those, it is a full two-day experience to immerse you in as much as we can about the FedEx industry to really help you make the decision as to whether or not this is the right business for you. So uh, I would encourage you to come out to one of those if you haven't been to one. Um, and then for all of my contractors here, we have our big annual expo summit and party coming up on August 20th and 21st in Las Vegas. Uh, last week, Spencer walked through some hints of what you can expect at the expo this year. Uh, so go ahead and watch that webinar if you want to hear more about it. But I hope to see all of you there uh, in a couple of months now. We're really close. Um, and then before we get into it, the uh, as you know, what we do every week here um, in order to answer one of your questions, you have to first answer one of ours. So uh, the question of the week this week is, what was the very first movie that you ever saw in theaters and who took you there? Um, so when we get to the Q&A section at the end, first answer that question of ours uh, and then submit your question. And when you are submitting that question, put it in the Q&A section at the bottom, not the chat. If you put it in the chat, we will miss it. So uh, just make sure to answer our question once we get there, and I'll remind you of the question once we get to it. So um, before we get to the Q&A, last thing is just going over some content for this week. Um, so we are very quickly approaching the end of the year, uh, and with that comes the holiday peak season, uh, which can be one of the most profitable times of the year, and for many, it can also be one of the most stressful times. But as we get closer to peak season, um, we will do a few different webinars on tactics to prepare and be successful. But today I wanted to spend a little bit of time going over the timeline and then both what buyers and sellers need to be aware of if you wanna have a successful acquisition in the FedEx space before the end of the year. So um, first, just a, a quick overview for any of you who may not be familiar with uh, when the peak season starts and ends or what it, what it is. Um, so the holiday peak season um, as we it, it basically the end of the year that typically begins around Black Friday. Um, and that's the point where you'll see the biggest volume bump is around Black Friday. Uh, and it'll continue on through the end of December. Um, I will say in recent years, you'll probably have seen a lot of businesses who start those sales a week or even two weeks earlier than Black Friday now. So we're starting to see Peak season start even earlier, um, but just in general, when we refer to peak season, we're really mostly talking about the last six to eight weeks of the year that are kind of bookended by Black Friday and Christmas. Um, and, and to clarify, when I'm talking about peak season here, it's mainly for p and um, For line haul, there is increased volume available during this period of time. Um, so you can prepare additional resources and you can take advantage of that volume, but there just aren't the same contractual requirements of you as a contractor that we see on the P&D side. So a little bit less stressful. There is still additional volume and, and uh, profitability to capture in that time period. It just looks a little bit different in terms of what you're required to do. Now, holidays uh, may seem really far away, but those months are going to disappear. <laughs> so uh, for those of you who are looking to get into this industry for the first time um, as buyers, there's just a couple of things that I want you to consider from a timeline perspective. 
Um, so as a reminder, once you get to the point where you have interviewed and passed that interview, uh, it's still going to take about six to eight weeks before you'll get a stand-up date and close. So um, the closer we get to peak season two, the more selective terminal managers will be about who they'll approve. Um, so if you want to close before peak season really gets up and running, you're ideally interviewing by August or early September, um, which means that you need to have identified a business by the end of July or August to put an offer on and pursue that so that you'll have enough time to finalize a contract and set up that interview and get it done in the right timeline to have a chance at closing before peak season. And that's just if you want to close by November or late October. Um, ideally, you're closing before that and trying to accelerate that process as much as possible so that you can learn the business uh, and get your arms around what daily operations look like before the craziness of peak volume really hits and begins. Now, I don't want this to be a huge doom and gloom scare tactic thing here um, that you're running out of time, but I do want everyone to be aware of that window so that as it begins to close for an acquisition, you are doing everything you possibly can to be ready to move quickly when the right deal comes. So uh, if you're a buyer right now, what can you be doing? What should you be doing to try to set that up for success? Um, the first main things are the things we always preach and talk about, which are the four pillars uh, to make sure that you're ready for that interview. So um, first is just finishing your RFI, uh, the request for vendor information. It's really the business plan that you'll need to submit to FedEx uh, in order to set up that interview. So it's a kind of a combination of a um, resume type structure, but also a business plan emphasizing what you're bringing to the table and your plan to make sure the business is successful. And you really wanna nail that down as soon as you can, um, because you can do that and really do most of it before you've ever finalized what deal or business you're looking at. Um, so that's something you can be working on immediately. And then the closer we get to peak season, really, honestly, as soon as August or and, and it's, it doesn't even hurt to start on this in July. But if you're interviewing as we get closer to peak season, um, it's important to start to put together a true peak plan um, that puts on paper what your plans are to be successful around hiring um, and around adding extra vehicles for peak season and really putting that down to show that you have a plan in place to be successful for peak season. Um, and, and if you want an example of what those peak season uh, templates are that we put together for interviews, just reach out to the team. And we can send you an example. But the closer you get to peak season, the more you need to prove uh, in the interview and in your RFI that you are ready and capable to be successful during this most important um, and, and really one of the, the highest volume times of the year uh, to comfort and give confidence to that terminal manager. Um, the next thing you want to be doing is as much as you possibly can to secure or have a, a proper financing plan in place. So whether that's freeing up additional liquidity, uh, converting your retirement funds to a ROBS, a, a rollover for business startups, um, or speaking with as many banks as you can to get any kind of pre-approval that they will give, uh, basically making sure that they have your information so that all that you're waiting on is the deal information to input and get the financing in place to really help accelerate your timeline around a purchase and knowing what you potentially have available to make that purchase once you've found a deal. Um, you'll also wanna go ahead and get incorporated as either an S Corp or a C Corp before your interview. It is a requirement for that interview step. Um, and the S and C Corp are the only designations that are allowed for incorporation with FedEx. And then the last thing is to just either have a contract drafted if you're working on your own um, or review an existing contract. If you're working with us, we have an asset purchase agreement that you can review at any time. Um, if you're working with another broker, they should have something similar available as well. And the goal there is just to make sure that you're as familiar as you can, or if you want to have a lawyer review that in advance to know what um, kind of changes and contingencies you may want to add. Um, any time you can save around the contract will just get you to that interview faster. So um, finalizing those four pillars, which is RFI, uh, financing, incorporation, and the reviewing of the contract uh, is, is just a really critical step towards being able to accelerate that deal as much as you possibly can in a limited time frame you may have. Um, and so if you want to be able to capture those additional profits that can come from peak season, you just need to make sure that once a deal comes, you're ready and able to move as quickly as you can. 
Um, now for sellers or potential sellers, I, ha I have a few pieces of advice as well. Um, so the first one is that if you are thinking about or considering selling and you haven't listed yet, you'll want to initiate that process as soon as you can. Um, if you want to have a chance of closing before peak season, if that is your goal to close before peak season, then it is important to start as soon as you can. Um, I talked about the timeline for buyers, but you'll need to add at least a week or two on the front end to that timeline because you need to account for uh, valuations and marketing processes to get that listing up and running and find buyers. Um, and then for everyone who is already in process and trying to sell before peak season, one of the most important things I would tell you to start to think about and do is to make sure your business is as prepared as it can be for peak season, as if you weren't going to run it or as if you were still going to run it. Um, it is always best when you're going through this process to plan as if you won't sell before peak season so that you won't be struggling to hire and secure trucks at the last minute. But putting those plans in place is also going to make the terminal much more comfortable and make the transition much smoother um, so that when a new buyer comes in, they're just basically inheriting the plans and steps you've already done. Um, I would also recommend at least thinking about some kind of transition period where you will agree to support the buyer through peak season in whatever capacity you can. Um, the closer we get to the end of the year, the more that you'll need to convince the terminal that a new buyer can still be successful. And so one of the things you can do there outside of just talking to them and telling them what a great buyer they are um, is to help provide a lot of that confidence by ensuring that one way another or another, they're gonna, the, the new buyer will be successful during peak season and saying, I will help them through it for this period of time, or I have already set this up from a hiring and truck perspective. So the, as much of that as you can do, um, the more you will help kind of smooth this transition and make sure the buyer actually can come in. Because like I said earlier, the closer, the closer we get as we get into September, or October, um, it really does take a little bit more convincing to get a terminal manager to agree. So sometimes we have to be a little bit creative. And some of that is just making sure that you are providing as much confidence as you possibly can to that terminal manager. Um, one more thing on the line haul timeline uh, is just to be aware of, um, like I said, peaks a little bit different, but there is a blackout period um, that comes every September in which FedEx will halt any approval process that you're going through until they have finalized those updated rates that come out every September and then rolled those out to contractors. So if you are in process, they will stop everything for about a month um, until those rates are finalized. So just be aware that if you haven't closed by the end of August, you'll be looking at October or November and really wanting to show FedEx at that point that your buyer does have a plan in mind uh, for handling any additional volume or resources that they're expecting you to handle for peak season. Because like I said, there's no contractual requirement to take more, but they're often counting on you to service additional runs or at least provide resources. And it's a good idea to do so. So you wanna make sure that your buyer is prepped and ready for that if the deal does extend until after that blackout period in September. Now, again, none of this is here where I am trying to scare anyone. Um, what I'm trying to do is just make sure that everyone is aware of the urgency that you really need to be thinking about if you want to close this year and really set yourself up well for the first holiday season. Um, peak can be a very lucrative time of year, but if you are jumping in and there's no plan in place and you're not inheriting any operations, it can be a really stressful one. So whether you're getting in for the first time or if you're trying to sell your business, the, the goal and the finish line of before peak season now, everybody just needs to be working together to make sure that we're getting as prepared as possible um, and doing everything we can to provide confidence to terminal managers and staff at the terminal to make sure that this transition is possible. So uh, that's it around that timeline. Um, and I'm sure people will have questions about it when we get to the Q&A. But first, we are going to jump into the inventory for this week, and then we will answer any questions you have for today. Um, and as a reminder, after, after Bridget comes on and does the inventory, the question of the day for anyone who missed it is what was the first movie that you attended and who took you? Um, so I, Bridget, I see you're on here. If you want to go over the new inventory for the week and then we'll get to the Q&A. All right. Well, thank you for giving me some time today, Josh, because I have 23 listings to tell you all about. Um, and I will give you kind of an abbreviated version um, we like to highlight some fun facts about these businesses, but uh, obviously if you need more information, please reach out to our team here at Route Consultant. Uh, we'll get started with P&D. 
We have um, two out of East Columbus, Ohio. This is uh, two carved portions of the same business. The first one is 13 P&D routes listed for 1 million. This is currently operating around a 15 to 16% EBITDA margin. It comes with one manager and two spare trucks. And all of these trucks are 2017 models or newer. The next carve uh, out of East Columbus is a six P&D route operation. This comes from that same contractor. It's listed at 400,000 and it comes with three spare trucks. Next P&D we have is out of Lufkin, Texas. This is five P&D routes listed at 595,000, currently operating around a 19% EBITDA margin. It does come with one manager and a brand new fleet. There are also two spare drivers on staff for growth and contingency or just transition help. <laughs> uh, next one we have is out of Rockford, Illinois. This uh, two was carved up into two different portions. The first one being a little bit smaller is nine P&D routes. Uh, this one is listed at 390,000. It comes with one manager, one spare truck, and is a dent CSA located uh, in close proximity to the terminal. The next carve out of Rockford is 11 P&D routes listed at 815,000. This one comes with two managers and two spare trucks. And again, is that dent CSA located close to the terminal. Next one we have is out of Terre Haute, Indiana. This is gonna be 12 P&D routes listed at 1.26 million. This one's currently operating around a 17 to 18% EBITDA margin, comes with two managers and two spare trucks. Uh, could be a remote ownership opportunity for somebody. And uh, the entirety of this fleet consists of 2021 or newer vehicles. So pretty impressive there. Next one we have is out of Northern California. This is 23 P&D routes listed at 2.85 million. Uh, this is operating around a 19% EBITDA margin. It comes with four managers and 14 spare trucks. And this one uh, should be SBA eligible. Next one we have is out of St. Petersburg, Florida. Uh, this one is 11 P&D routes listed at uh, 1,080,000. This one's currently operating around a 15% EBITDA margin. It comes with two managers and two spare trucks and also two spare drivers on staff. Uh, two, two, two right there in St. Petersburg. Next one we have is out of Charleston, South Carolina. This is an 11 P&D route operation listed at 850,000. This too is operating around a 15% EBITDA margin. Uh, this comes with one manager that has six years of experience with this business. It comes with two spare trucks. 10 of the trucks that are coming with this sale are 2019 or newer. And uh, this one in Charleston also comes with three spare drivers. Next one we have is out of Atlanta, Georgia. This is seven P&D routes listed at 989,000. This is currently operating around a 25 to 26% EBITDA margin. Comes with one manager and six spare trucks. There should be assumable truck debt and seller financing available for that one in Atlanta, Georgia. That's gonna be a hot listing there. Um, Jackson, the next one we have is Jacksonville, Florida. This one is 15 P&D routes listed at 290,000. That's only around 25% of revenue. Uh, this is going to come with one manager, has low daily miles. Uh, there are no trucks included in the sale. However, it would qualify or should qualify for uh, Hello Truck Lease program. If you wanted in more information on that, someone from our team could get you connected. Next one we have is out of Columbus, Ohio. Uh, this one is, uh, sorry, eight P&D routes listed at 850,000. This one is currently operating around that 20 uh, percent EBITDA margin. It does come with one manager uh, to be a potential BC for you. And it does come with one spare truck as well. Uh, next one we have here, uh, these are our line haul businesses. If you've been waiting for line haul, we have quite a few today. Uh, the first one is out of Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. We have this carved up into three different portions. So the first one is going to be two line haul runs listed at 910,000 currently operating at an 18.5% EBITDA margin. Uh, 
it is two temporary dedicated team runs and it comes with two spare drivers available for contingency. Next carved out portion is out of Allentown, Pennsylvania. Uh, again, two line haul runs. This one's listed at 90, uh, 999,000. This is operating around a 26 to 27% EBITDA margin. It's one dedicated solo run um, and one dedicated team run. Again, there's another spare driver here available for contingency. And this, the buyer may assume the existing truck leases at no additional cost. The third car is out of Syracuse. This is nine line haul runs listed at 1.3 million. This consists of five dedicated solo runs, two dedicated team runs, and two unassigned solos. There are four spare drivers available uh, with this portion of the listing. And the, again, the buyer may assume the existing truck leases from uh, the current contractor at no additional cost. Next one we have is out of Portland, Oregon. This is nine line haul runs listed at 4 million. This one's currently operating around a 17% EBITDA margin. It does come with one manager. It consists of three dedicated team runs, one dedicated solo run, one unassigned team run, and four unassigned solos. Um, all of these trucks are from 2018 or newer, and five of these trucks are uh, leased. So that's gonna cut on your uh, repair and maintenance costs. And uh, there should be some seller financing available on this as well. I feel like I'm an auctioneer. Am I going too fast? <laughs> okay, we're down to the very bottom, guys. Hang in there with me. Uh, these are our Amazon listings. We have uh, just a few to get, get through today. Uh, the first one is out of Orlando, Florida. This is going to be 20 DSP routes listed at 700,000. Comes with one manager and three spare trucks. Next Amazon listing we have is out of Baltimore, Maryland, 15 DSP routes listed at 3.2 million, currently operating around a 26 to 27% EBITDA margin. Um, and these routes uh, specifically in Baltimore are uh, the Amazon line haul business. This is gonna be an Amazon line haul business. Uh, next one we have is out of Michigan. This is going to be 40 DSP routes listed at 2.5 million, currently operating around a 19 to 20% EBITDA margin. It does come with four managers and one spare truck. Next one we have is out of Southern New Jersey. This is going to be 20 DSP routes listed at 1.55 million. Uh, this is right around a 17 to 18% EBITDA margin, comes with two managers and four spare trucks. Out of the greater Charlotte area in North Carolina, we have 25 DSP routes listed at 1.9 million. That's uh, operating right now around a 19% EBITDA margin. It comes with two managers and 12 spare trucks, just in case. Uh, next one we have is out of Houston, Texas. This is 35 DSP routes. This is listed at 1.5 million. It comes with one manager and is an efficient operation with multiple managers in place to run the daily operation. And the last one we have here is out of Metro West Boston, Massachusetts. It is 20 DSP routes listed at 1.525 million. This is currently operating around an 18% EBITDA margin. It comes with two managers. There should be some seller financing available. And this business is veteran owned and operated. And that does it for me for the rest of the day. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you so much, Bridget, for your- You're welcome. I really did feel like I was an auctioneer for a minute. <laughs> All right, and next one we have is that a Terre Haute, Indiana. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you guys uh, for, for hanging out. Yeah, perfect. So reminder for everybody, and I see I see that the questions have come in that you're uh, answering the question, but just a reminder, um, it is what was the first movie you attended and who did you go with? And, and I'll go first, Bridget, to make sure you get some water and some time to recover. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so my first movie was Jurassic Park. Uh, the original, I still haven't seen the new one. I don't know if I will. It doesn't look like it's got good reviews. Um, but yeah, it was, uh, my mom took me. Uh, I don't really know 
why they decided to allow me to go see that when I was that young, but I did. So I still remember it as my first movie. One of those that um, I remembered enough to be terrified as a uh, young child. And so I got over it, but um, I, it, it is vivid. Lots still. Therapy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Nice. Okay. Well, my first movie, I really obviously didn't leave much of an impression on me. I remember the theater because it was right by our house. It's no longer there. They turned it into a, a shooting range. Um, <laughs> but I think it was like a Tarzan or a Winnie the Pooh and, and my older sister took me. I do remember that. But uh, more importantly for me, I remember my first like movie that I was allowed to go to by myself without like supervision. So it was in middle school, it was a birthday party. My parents dropped me off and it was this funny movie called Mad Money. If any of you have seen it, I will be really impressed because this was probably like the weirdest movie ever, but it had uh, Queen Latifah in it and that left quite the impression on me. <laughs> so uh, I've heard of it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, now I know what I'm getting you for Christmas. So. <laughs> okay, sure. <laughs> All right. Well, we can get to the Q&A now and see uh, what kind of movies you guys were uh, interested in back in the day and what kind of questions we have. All right, we'll get started with one from John. John says, I don't remember the movie, but I remember having a birthday party at the movie theater with all my friends when I was probably six or seven years old. Okay. Yeah, well, stay with me. I mean, I can tell you the color of the carpet and everything, but I don't <laughs> remember exactly what that first movie was. Um, he wants to know, how does uh, Route Consultant recommend new contractors uh, with less than four months of experience as a contractor to fight for renegotiation when we don't necessarily have all of the history of expenses and obviously things are rising, uh, costs are rising. Any thoughts? Have you all seen any new contractors uh, be awarded renegotiation? Um, the p and manager recommended getting receipts from the previous owner around the time our contracts were uh, negotiated. So do we have any kind of insight here for re renegotiation? Yeah, yeah, because I mean, the tough thing is that you're trying to provide as much data as you can. So you're not going to have too much at less than four months, but you may even be able to just show the difference in prices from when you started to now. So even that difference could help in the renegotiation. It's definitely good advice that if you can get any kind of, and even if you have P&Ls from the initial acquisition on what the cost line items were for things like fuel uh, or payroll, there, there may be at least some manner of difference you can show by comparing the previous business to yours. Um, but you're just trying to provide as much data as you can. I have seen contractors who are newer. I don't know if I've talked to anybody who's been as new as, as three months and do a re and even attempt a renegotiation. I can't say that I've seen any rejected or accepted because I don't think I've talked to anyone who's tried it that early in their first contract. Um, but really the name of the game there is just trying to show as much data as you can. And like I said, it, it may even be that from three months ago, it may be that fuel's already risen a couple of dollars. So you may be able to at least show that difference just in the time you've had. And you're just trying to put together as much as you possibly can around that data. Great. Uh, next one we have here is from Christian. Christian says, I watched the first X-Men movie with my family and friends for my birthday. Classic. We love X-Men. Uh, okay, Christian wants to know, can prospective contractors or investors attend the expo in Las Vegas? If so, should I sign up as a guest contractor? So we do try to keep this to a contractor only event. Um, I will say that if you are in process on a deal and you've gotten past the interview and are close to a standup, we'll sometimes allow you to attend and make exceptions. But this is something where we do want it to be for contractors designed around um, giving advice and helping coach around the future for these new contractors and providing a celebration. So um, we may make exceptions, but it just depends on how far you are in the process. So if you're still really early, Probably not until next year, but if you've made some progress or past the interview stage, reach out to the team and we'll see what we can do. All right. Uh, next one we have here is from Will. Will said his first uh, movie theater experience was Jurassic Park with his dad. 
Well, Will, we have that in common. <laughs> <laughs> um, he wants to know how realistic is it for someone with a full-time job to own a P&D route um, as purely an investor, assuming there is a competent manager involved? In other words, what would you say is the minimum amount of hours um, of commitment per week needed by an investor owner to continue the successful operation? Obviously, it can vary route to route and depending on uh, the time of the year, but do we have any insight here for yeah. what? So I would say truly as a pure investor, it's going to be pretty unlikely, um, at least for a first operation when you get to a certain scale, maybe. Um, but what I what I more so say is there are plenty of businesses that may not require you to be fully present physically day to day. Um, it depends on what your full-time job is. If you have any availability to take calls or answer things or do certain things on the business remotely, it may be something you can run without having to actually physically be present. Um, I would just encourage you not to view this as a pure investor opportunity. There are some things, particularly in your first acquisition, where you'll want to be involved in the business, make sure you run the business um, especially if you're getting it right during peak season uh, this year, where you're going to want to make sure that you are involved. Um, really competent manners or ownership structures can help and make where there is less you need to do. Um, but I would I would encourage you to view it as something you want to be available for and involved in, um, even if you're not physically present. All right. Uh, next one we have here is from Melissa. Melissa said the first movie I ever saw in theater was the Titanic. And she said it was so sad. I didn't go back for at least a year. Uh, <laughs> she also added that uh, her cool aunt was the one who took her to see this movie. Uh, yeah. I'm, I'm really impressed, Melissa, that one, you sat through this entire movie uh, because it is really like traumatic and sad, but it's also so long. Like I remember having two VHS tapes for this movie oh, at our I, house. <laughs> The, day you the VHS. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's yeah. a great movie, um, but yeah, it must have been the cool aunt who took you as your first movie to see <laughs> Titanic. <laughs> That's awesome. Okay. So she has kind of a multi part question here, but all kind of related. And she wants to know do you pay your drivers overtime? Are there any strategies to avoid there? Yeah. So the simplest strategy is the one we use, which is that we do not have any trucks under 10,000 pounds. Uh, so you, we don't have to pay overtime. And so we don't, we pay daily rate. Uh, we still track hours from a compliance perspective, but um, because all of our trucks are over 10,000 pounds, we don't have to worry about overtime. Um, if you're not in that situation or making that kind of fleet change uh, isn't really in the cards from a CapEx perspective, or maybe the routes don't justify it, uh, your main thing there is trying to make sure that you're structuring routes and scheduling properly um, and kind of mapping it out from a weekly perspective so that no one is ever going above 40 hours. That can be difficult to do. And sometimes that can be something that we will incentivize our BCs around of saying, hey, um, I'm trying to avoid any overtime. I need you from a scheduling uh, and routing perspective to try to make sure that every driver stays below 40 hours. And if you can do that, we'll give you a bonus. And so there's things like that you can do if it's something that's not in your skill wheelhouse. Um, but that is, it's something that you're kind of going to have to play with and it may vary week to week what you have to do, but it's something that will have an impact on payroll if you can avoid uh, overtime. Okay, um, a follow up to that. Do you guys give PTO? If so, how much? And do you calculate it into your employment costs? And then yeah. kind of related to that too, do you ever have drivers share trucks or split shifts for efficiency? Yeah, so we, we do have PTO. Uh, it'll vary based on the driver and the tenure. Uh, and we do calculate that as a part of a payroll cost that we're looking into. I mean, when we're calculating overall payroll, we kind of include that number, um, especially when we're projecting it. So that is a part of business. We, we do find drivers really value PTO and it can go a long way towards retention. Um, from uh, driver sharing trucks or splitting um, shifts for efficiency, we do have drivers who will sometimes share trucks like that's not something uh, we, we, you know, we try to keep consistency so the drivers are comfortable in their trucks, but um, a lot of times we have multiple trucks that are of the same type, so it's not a huge issue to change it. Um, and so sometimes those trucks do change. Sometimes we do have uh, drivers who share trucks, especially if we have anybody who's part time only on the weekends. Um, and if you're referring to having two drivers in the truck, like from a helper or a jumper. 
Um, we don't do it often. Uh, the only time we really do it is if it's on a, a heavy mall route, we might look at something like that. All right. Uh, next one we have here is from Diana. And Diana says, my first movie was Scream with my mom. The attendant told me people would walk around and scare other people. So <laughs> I was <laughs> on the lookout the entire time. Oh, um, I probably would have walked out of the movie. <laughs> yeah. Talk about trauma, uh, scaring oh, someone for their first movie. <laughs> and yeah, Bridget, yeah. I know how you are with scares. So <laughs> that would not have worked out well. Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty pathetic. Uh, <laughs> okay, so she has a, a two-part question as well. First one, uh, with holidays come theft and robberies. What happens if a driver is held up since the anti-theft won't allow someone to take a truck? So in terms of what happens, um, hopefully, the, tri hopefully the, <laughs> the robber just kind of leaves when they realize they can't steal the truck. A lot of that is kind of designed around um, trying to prevent some of that. Um, so hopefully that's the result. Um, 911 gets called, I'm sure. Um, but the idea is that that anti-theft discourages um, holdups because they realize that they can't actually steal the truck and steal the packages. Um, so that it could be that they still hold up the truck and steal the packages, at least some of them kind of carrying them away instead of actually taking the truck. But that gives you more time for um, something positive to happen or for police to show up. So uh, it's still a positive. Um, yeah. Yeah. And you can correct me if I'm wrong, Josh, but I think in some cases FedEx will provide an armed guard. Um, yeah. You're in an area that has kind of a proven issue around um, security, then there are um, certain routes that FedEx will approve and pay for an armed guard in the truck. Um, so it's rare. It shouldn't. Hopefully, it's not something you'll all have to encounter. But in the areas where you still have to deliver packages, and it still has to be something where you've got to get that truck on the road, there are some cases where FedEx will provide that. Absolutely. All right. A follow up from Diana. Uh, she says, "I'm starting the process now to purchase PND to prep for peak season. Should I look into renting extra trucks right away instead of Hello Truck?" Uh, since they'll only be needed for peak season, depending on what the current fleet is. So it, it's definitely going to be a function of the current fleet. Um, also, Hello Truck, you know, the leasing model does depend on the density of the territory. Um, but what I would say is if you're inheriting a fleet where you are anticipating that you're going to have to buy trucks um, or make some truck changes, then it may make more sense to go ahead and add those trucks now before peak season and then just use the current fleet plus extra trucks and then maybe you keep those extra trucks as spare after peak or you sell them. Um, but if you've got a current fleet that's enough, um, you're probably just going to be uh, renting extra trucks because unless you're expecting huge, massive growth uh, in the beginning of the year, you're most likely going to be um, just renting trucks for temporary volume through those last eight weeks of the year. Yeah. Um, okay, next one we have here is from an anonymous attendee. Uh, their first movie was Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. Uh, they said they went with their mother, their aunt, and cousins. That's sweet. That's a good one. Um, <laughs> they want to know what is the incremental revenue or volume that should be expected during peak? It, it, it's really variable depending on the territory. Um, we see some that are as high as 30 percent um, increases in volume every week or 50 percent, some even as high as 100 percent. But uh, the, the thing you will see is leading up to peak season, FedEx will provide volume projections um, so that you can kind of get a sense of what you can expect come peak season. Uh, and if you're buying from someone or if you've never run this territory before, uh, you can try to get settlement statements or at least an idea from the previous seller for what kind of volume bump they they saw during last peak season and that'd be the best way to do it all right um next one we have oh well this isn't a, a question yet at least um from frost he says it's been a long time it was a long time ago i don't remember the name of the movie uh but i remember it was a comedy movie by bud spencer if you remember the name of it, uh, please let us know. <laughs> um, okay, next question we have is from Riley. Riley says, uh, my first movie, which I uh, snuck into, was The Apocalypse. 
Um, okay. And the question is, uh, if a seller is selling routes with no trucks, what is the going rate of a lease truck? Do we have any figures on that? Yeah, so Riley, reach out to the team after this. We can get you actual figures, especially depending on the, the, the territory, because some of it is a function of the mileage driven by those routes, because there is a, a certain component that's a mileage rate. Um, but it is it is an ongoing, at least with Hello Truck Leasing, if you go to, I think actually that Danielle put the link in the chat um, where you can go in and see some, some uh, material on it. But it is, it is a, a full service lease that includes repair and maintenance, and it's a three-year lease. So um, that's what I would advise if it's possible, um, especially because used trucks are still going at a premium right now. So if you're trying to have a um, and pick up a full fleet um, and, and the mileage makes sense, the leasing model works really well because you can get them quickly and you don't have to pay for an entire fleet of CapEx on day one. So that's, I'd look at it, we've got the link, but if you need more questions, just reach out to the team and we can get you details on that. Okay. Great. Um, and we did have a question from Frost, um, actually a little bit lower. Um, Frost was the Bud Spencer movie. He wanted to know, uh, do we have any idea about today's SBA rates for line haul? And I'd just expand on that for, for P&D too. Um, do we have any idea of what that is? They, they are increasing. Um, so it, it's a, it depends on the bank, depends on the deal, but uh, I'm seeing as high as eight or 9% now. Um, and I wouldn't, it could even get higher in the future as the uh, the rates keep getting increased by the Fed. Um, but right now that is about where it is. And yeah, it's the same for line haul or PND. Okay, okay, great. Um, next one we have here is from Edward. Edward says his first um, theater experience was the Jungle Book with his dad, another classic. Um, he wants to know what would be better when buying a, buying a route with no trucks at a cheaper price or buying a route with older trucks that have maybe more than 200,000 miles or higher on them. Okay, so two factors to think through. Um, the trucks, the, the fleet or the uh, business with no trucks, you can kind of compare the cost difference. So if it's $100,000 more to buy the truck or to buy the business with trucks, um, versus buying them without, you, can, you, you probably should look through and see what kind of prices you can get for that number of trucks and kind of compare that cost breakdown. But the biggest thing in determining how valuable those 200,000 mile trucks are uh, is knowing the mileage of the territory. If it's a really dense territory, 200,000 mile trucks is, is not that bad. They can last for a little while longer, at least a few years if you need it. But if you're in a high mileage territory, they're gonna hit 300, 400 really quickly. And so that is a kind of something where you will have a, a, a pretty large CapEx expenditure early. So um, it may be worth it to get uh, the business without trucks if you can find the right prices, or if you have, uh, you know, the leasing model won't work for the really high mileage territory. So really it's more about looking at what prices you can get for that number of trucks and comparing the cost differential, but I'd at least consider it if it is a high mileage territory and high mileage fleet with, with all the trucks over 200,000, then it does mean you've got some CapEx in the future, the very near future that you need to consider when you're thinking about the price. Okay. Um, next one we have here is from John. Uh, this is kind of tragic, but John says, my first movie was Return of the Jedi. My sister and I went with our aunt. We left early because of the robot torture scene and ended up getting mugged on the way home. Oh, man. <laughs> this is awful. Really bad first movie story. Return of the yeah. Jedi is great, but yeah. Great movie, but really awful important. experience. Yeah, man. <laughs> um, <laughs> we've really, we're hurting for you, John. Um, we hope you went and saw the rest of the, uh, <laughs> the Star Wars movies. <laughs> We, we know Josh is a big fan. Um, uh, he wants to, so John wants to know with tighter operational margins, is Spencer recommending a higher operational reserves for a purchase? Um, I would say that it is something that you should start to look at having a larger war chest or uh, a larger a larger kind of capital reserve. Um, but the real thing is to, if, if you're going into this and expecting it to be your only income stream, that's when it's more important to have maybe a larger reserve to support you um, as margins tighten. Um, but if it is something where this is going to be one of multiple income streams and it's not as important, um, but if it is your only job and this is gonna be your full-time business, 
Um, I would look at that tighter margin, think about what kind of capital reserves you have um, available just in case. Uh, it may be too that you're just kind of forecasting conservatively, which is how we do it. Um, and if you do it that way, it may be that you're already accounting for some of those continued tightening. But um, I would say at a time like this, it's always best to have increased reserves when you, when you can so that you can weather any storm that comes. All right. Uh, next one we have here is from Sam. Sam says uh, his first theater experience was um, to watch Alien. He said, uh, my dad took me and my mom was very upset. <laughs> I, that. Yeah, I, think, I think the alien bursting out of a chest would get me as a child. And I don't think I would have forgotten that one. If Jurassic Park got me, Alien definitely would have. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Um, all right. My question is, how does the assumable truck debt work? Do I just sign up for it or do I have to apply for separate financing? Um, also, does having an existing fleet help with financing as collateral as opposed to only having a leased fleet? This seems to be one of the biggest differences between FedEx and Amazon. So yes. kind of a loaded question, but uh, how does seller financing work? We'll start with that. Yeah. And, and okay, so uh, the assumable truck debt, assumable truck debt, sorry. Yeah, the, the assumable truck debt, the way it works is, let's say it was a million dollar deal and there was 300,000 of assumable truck debt. Uh, and you assumed it, you would pay the difference remaining. So you, if, if it was a million dollars, 300K of truck of assumable truck debt, you would only have to bring 700K to the table in addition to assuming that debt. Uh, and the way the assumption works is um, uh, if it is assumable, then the bank can transfer that to you. They will most likely do some kind of credit check or background check, but um, typically it's not a very difficult process. We work with a lot of these lenders on this assumption of debt. Um, so they'll they'll kind of work with you on that um, and then basically transfer that debt to you in the process. So uh, once you've gotten a little bit farther down the line, we'll work on that. Um, but that is basically how the process works. Now, as far as financing, um, I would say for a lot of banks, it is helpful to have uh, an owned fleet that you can use as collateral because when they are looking at financing the business, um, and, and I would say this is different than the assumable truck debt. Assumable truck debt happens and the collateral is the trucks. Like it's just a, a, just a transfer of those trucks and that debt. Um, but truly financing the business, uh, it is helpful that there are owned trucks instead of leased trucks. They'll view it as an additional um, collateral and hard asset that they can use to value the business. Um, but you know, we do have deals, like uh, particularly on the line haul side, a lot of trucks will often be leased, not owned. Uh, or the entire fleet will be leased. It's one of the, the best operating models we've seen for the line haul side. And we do still see those deals get financed. So while it can be helpful, it doesn't mean you can't finance a deal that all the trucks are leases. All right. Um, next one we have here is from PJ. PJ said his first movie was 007 Golden Finger. Is Gold that? Finger. Is it? Gold Finger. Yeah. It's, oh, okay. Oh, Goldfinger. Sorry. I was thinking in my head, Golden Eye, like James uh -huh. Bond. Or, yeah. Is which that is also 007. Same thing. It's 007. Yeah. Yeah. You know, <laughs> okay. I'm sorry. Our knowledge is limited. Bridget, it's fine. It, 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 I'm sorry. Yeah. Y'all have to be patient with me here. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and he said his parents took him to go see that. Okay. He wants to know, um, and I don't know where he got this information, but he said, I'm told that as a current 33 year year FedEx employee, I cannot own routes. Can a current employee simply be an investor or maybe an advisor with managers in place? Yeah, so if you are a FedEx corporate employee, um, then they typically will not allow you to own uh, routes as a contractor. So that is true. Um, and so you could be an investor, but not the authorized owner or authorized officer. So you can't be the one that the contract is actually tied to. You could be someone providing funds to somebody else who is going to be the authorized officer. And basically you could just be a shareholder in that company, um, but you would not be allowed to be the AO and the person actually with the contract tied to them. All right. Um, next one we have here is from Ram. Ram said the first Hollywood movie I saw um, or remember is Home Alone. He said, I, I enjoyed it and had a nice laugh. 
Yep. Um, I enjoy that movie every Christmas <laughs> still. Um, okay, so contract renewal is due in December. Does it make sense to uh, have a contract renegotiation in September before the renewal? Um, does that have any kind of impact on um, the contract renewal in December if you renegotiate in September? I think that's how I'm interpreting the question. Yep, you, you can try to renegotiate early and I, I'd probably try before September if you can. Um, the closer you get to peak season, the less likely they are to, to start a renegotiation process just because there's so many other things going on. Um, but I, if you can, it's, and if they approve it, it's perfectly fine. And basically you would have a new contract timeline uh, set of year or two years from that standpoint. Um, so it would go from there as that new start date. Um, so it's perfectly fair to try. They may not approve you, but uh, it's not going to hurt you to attempt to renegotiate. Okay. Um, next one we have here is from Say. Say says, uh, my first movie was Signs with my friends. A lot of scary movies, you guys. <laughs> Um, I'm definitely a, more of the, the Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs type of <laughs> genre. Uh, okay, question one, how do we know the true value of the fleet when the previous owner has mentioned a value in his listing? Is there any way to really like verify that? And then uh, number two, do we have to maintain additional drivers on standby, I guess, like for transitioning um, yeah, what is so, our, our suggestion there? Yeah. So from value of the fleet, um, it, especially like if, if you're seeing any listing, it's typically a fair market, uh, value, but the main thing we encourage strongly, it's built into all of our contracts and you should, um, if you're not going through us, whoever you use, you should make sure it's in your contract as well is a formal fleet inspection before closing where they'll actually go in and see if there's anything, um, that's a part of the fleet. Uh, or any kind of uh, repairs that need to happen before closing, before stand up, that will help you on that valuation side. Uh, if you want, you can, you know, you can always take the VIN numbers and go to Kelly Blue Book and see what kind of valuation it puts there. And that could be a negotiated number. Uh, it just does have uh, tax and um, equity uh, impacts in the actual contract. So that'd be something to look at. Um, but it, it's something that if the valuation's off, sometimes it can be negotiated, but also you, we do encourage the true inspection because. Um, we can't go in and see every truck. So that's why we really want you to make sure before stand up that you've had a mechanic look at it. Okay, right, awesome. Uh, we have a follow-up question here from Christian. Christian was um, the X-Men experience movie theater with the family. Um, he wants to know, is it typical for contractors to own the land where they park their vehicles? or what percentage of contractors actually park at the terminal? And then two, do you know what percentage of contractors own versus lease their vehicles? So it is very rare to see any contractor who owns the land um, separate from the terminal. Almost all contractors park all their vehicles at the terminal, it's free to do so. Um, I know a, a very few number of contractors who actually own the land and in some cases almost act as like their own terminal, but that is very rare. The vast majority park at the terminals and do it for free. Uh, and what was the second part of the question? Oh, uh, most, I would say most contractors own. Um, before Hello Truck Leasing, we always owned, but uh, because most leasing models didn't really make sense for the FedEx space, um, there are plenty of contractors who've moved to Hello Truck over the last year or two, um, because it is something we've designed as a way as to really be attractive. And it also gives a lot of flexibility since those leases will easily transfer to a new buyer and uh, the coverage repair and maintenance make, makes things really consistent. So there is a growing number of contractors who have moved to leasing, but you know, a few years ago, there wasn't really an option that made sense. So there were, there were only a few people who did it just because you could still get some full service leases. They were just really expensive to do so, but some people did it just for the, the ease of making sure that their repair and maintenance was always covered. Okay. Um... Next one we have here is from Melanie. Melanie says um, she cannot remember her first movie, but she's sure um, it was a comedy. I can get behind that. As long as it's not one of these horror films that all these people are uh, when to see. Horror up your alley. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, she says uh, with peak coming, can you talk a bit about contingency teams and how to profit from having them? Yeah. So 
during peak season, there will always be contractors who struggle, who are struggling now, and with the added volume, won't be ready or won't have additional resources. So there's a couple of different ways you can approach cont contingency. There are true contingency contracts you can get where you basically make a set number of resources available to FedEx anywhere in the district, and you'll send it wherever they need. Um, but you also may just have additional resources that um, you find out about contingency opportunities and you have resources available to send them. And so if you are going to have additional drivers and trucks telling your terminal in advance that you are uh, essentially going to have additional resources that you can send out on contingency is the main way to do it. And contingency generally pays at a, at a higher rate than uh, normal contracts will. So as you're helping struggling contractors or struggling territories during peak season, it can be really lucrative because of the additional amounts they pay for that volume. Okay. Um, next one we have here is from Melissa, and I think Melissa already gave us her answer, but I did, couldn't go back and find it. Uh, <laughs> she said uh, she's hoping she can get this this one answered today. So Melissa, I, I did you a favor here and skip to it. Uh, she says, "Do we need to have our own operating authority, or do we run under FedExes?" So this is a really nice thing with the FedEx space. You do operate under FedEx's operating authority under their DOT number. Um, this is a difference from Amazon. Uh, with Amazon, you do have to have your own DOT number and operating authority, uh, which has a lot of differences around insurance and implications there. And insurance is one of the uh, primary cost centers you have to control as an Amazon contractor. But with FedEx, um, you don't have to pay any external liability. Uh, you're just basically worried about workers' compensation and physical damages because you do operate under FedEx's DOT number. Okay, awesome. And we do have a few questions left and uh, we're, we're not gonna be able to get to all of them before our time runs out. We just have a few minutes, but I did wanna address a few we had come in about Amazon and profitability and pros and cons and, and stuff like that. But we actually have an Amazon series out now of videos that I think Annalie, Anna Lee maybe put together, Anna Lee and our team. So um, you can find those online. Uh, maybe we can drop a link to those in the chat. Uh, but if not, please reach out to our team. You can email me or anyone here and uh, we'll hopefully uh, get you that link so that you, you guys can learn more about the Amazon space. But I just wanted to address that before we ran out of time today. Yeah, and that is designed to try to answer all of the preliminary questions you would have around Amazon. It's our Amazon 101 course. Um, so it's it's about an hour worth of um, different videos and training that you can go through and try to get all your major answer, major questions answered around Amazon. Great. Okay, this next question is from Mark. Uh, Mark says, I think my first uh, movie was Rescuers Down Under. Great movie. I love that. Um, but he says, I'm considering purchasing with the intent to be a semi absentee um, owner with a manager in place. I've read that the owners may be only required to do around 10 hours of uh, work a week. Is this ever realistic? And what are those 10 hours spent doing if there is already a manager? So you kind of touched on this earlier, but I know Mark joins late. So uh, yeah. maybe we can give him a few tips here. Yeah, so it's, it is something um, that is possible. I have seen territories that do it. Um, and, and I'd encourage you, instead of having absentee, I would, I would think remote, where there may be things that you are doing in the day-to-day. -day, you just don't have to be physically present. Um, and a lot of what you're doing is going to be a function of what your manager is currently doing. So there are things like making sure the manager does daily dispatch in the morning, um, truck checks, just to make sure that Oil, tires, all of that is checked in the morning before the drivers go out. You can have drivers do their own checks, but it's nice to have managers do spot check. Some managers do preventive maintenance. Um, there are managers who run routes. There are managers who do cleanup routes. Um, if they're off the truck completely, they may be doing things like answering the phone for both FedEx or drivers is doing kind of spot check problem issues. Uh, routing at night through DRO, um, coaching and managing and scheduling. Um, and then what I find a lot of uh, owners do outside of all those responsibilities, because it just depends on how many of those managers are actually handling, um, are things like payroll, handling all of the finances, handling all of the administrative tasks you may have to do, um, dealing with just different vendors and making sure that the overall planning is done. So if you've got a manager who truly is handling all daily operations and is off the truck, so that they're really truly available throughout the day for both drivers and FedEx, then it could be something that's possible for where you're doing as little as 10 hours a week. But I would encourage you that at least in the first few months, 
to try to be as available as you can and try to just throw yourself into the business and then scale back once you've kind of seen what the manager is capable of and kind of decide how invested or how much time you have to put into the business. But really try to think first about making sure you understand the business, you understand everything the manager's doing, because if you just kind of come in and assume the manager's doing everything correctly before learning it, you may find that there are inefficiencies and errors that just continue because you've just expected the manager to know everything. So try to learn it all yourself and then scale back your time. And I, I think the 10 hours is possible. It just depends on the competencies of the manager and what your territory looks like when you inherit it. Awesome. All right. Well, that does it. We are officially a minute over our time, a lot of time today. So thank you, Josh, for getting to all those questions. Um, if we didn't get your question answered today, uh, please reach out to our team. If you need more information on FedEx or Amazon, we are more than happy to uh, help you there. But it's been a pleasure. Perfect. All right. Thanks, Bridget. Thanks, everybody. And we'll see you next week. All right.